Last week we concluded a series we called Follow, and for several months we've sought to follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. And in this series of sermons, we talked repeatedly about what it means to follow Jesus, that God gives definition to that. It's not something that happens on autopilot. It's not a pick and choose buffet line type of spirituality. It's, it's not casual Christianity. It's not a, how can I just blend in with the cultural Christianity that has nothing to do with the gospel, and yet we call it Christian? It's, it's more than being a fan of Jesus. Yeah, I've always been drawn to what Peter wrote in uh, the little letter called, we call First Peter in the Bible, and it says, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you would follow in his steps. In, in his steps. Now, follow means to follow in his steps. Jesus models what he expects from us. Jesus teaches what he expects from us. Jesus trained his disciples then in what he expects from us in disciples now. People claim all sorts of commitment to Christ in the last several months and our outreach efforts in the community. A lot of people say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But the truth is, if you're not following Christ, you're not a follower of Christ, right? Does that make sense? Is that a stretch of imagination theologically? If you're not following the way Jesus has defined it, the way God's Word declares it, you're not a follower. If you belong to Jesus, there's certain things that are going to happen in your life, certain things that will flow through your life, certain things that can be expected in your life. And the truth is, instead of being clear and measurable, we like to keep the Christian life poorly defined, vague, but God's Word really doesn't. There's certain things that happen in your life when you belong to Jesus. There's certain things that get discarded. There's certain things that get picked up. Certain things you do. Certain things you don't do. When your sin is forgiven, when heaven's going to be your home, when Jesus is truly your Savior and Lord, they're just things that happen. Now, the challenge from the Bible, and to put it simple, the challenge of the Bible, the Bible's message is when we say, I'm going to follow Jesus, you're just going to walk in a different way than everyone else. Your walk is going to stand out from the crowd. You're, you're, you're not going to blend in with society. And often you're going to be walking upstream instead of uh, just flowing with the crowd. And it's true. If you're in a crowd and everyone's watching, like right now, and it's true if no one is watching, it doesn't matter if the walk is pleasant or difficult. It doesn't matter the circumstances, what the physical, the emotional, the spiritual stresses are and strains. Walking as a follower of Christ just going to require a different step than the rest of the world. Now, I believe that in this age, which is maybe the ultimate age of self-identifying Christians, where folks declare Christian with any number of definitions separate from God's word. I believe that in an age of self-identifying Christians, disciples, even when life is in clear conflict with the teaching of God's word, I believe we need to understand what follow looks like. And we need to be clear on this. So we've been talking about follow and some of the outward things that happen when you follow Jesus. We're going to back this thing up and I debated which one of these to go with first, but now we're going to look at the things that happen in you that cause the outward fruitfulness of the Christian life. Here's the issue. When it comes to following Jesus, just in case uh, over the last several months of talking about follow Jesus, you felt like, well, that ain't working out. Uh, you can't do it. I mean... Pressure's off. There's no way I can do this. There's no way you can follow Jesus and be consistent and faithful in it. And because of that, because it's beyond your ability, sometimes people give up because it's hard. They give up because they fail. They don't do it perfectly the first time. And sometimes, sometimes they're just other things that are more pressing. The world seems to demand a lot out of us, and Jesus seems to be pretty easy going. And so when it comes down to making choices, well... I'm going to go with the one that's demanding things of me. And, and what happens is that the seed of the gospel gets choked out by the thorns. 
And God's word gets choked out by all those other things. There are things that happen through the life of a person who knows and follows Jesus. And there are also things that happen in the heart of a person who knows and follows Jesus. And James explored this link. He he talked about there's a link between belief and behavior. Between what you say you hold to in faith and what actually happens in your life. And he talked about it as faith and works. And he said, you declare you got a faith. But if you have a faith, there are going to be works that come out of it. They're going to be, there's going to be a tangible, measurable, discernible fruitfulness that comes out of that. And if that is not there, if there's not some things flowing out of that life, then what you're declaring is actually dead. It's not faith at all. It's maybe religion. It's maybe good intentions. It's maybe moralism. But it's not Jesus. You can't just believe in your heart and if it's real, there be not be some outward expression of the belief. Jesus made the same point. He explained to people, you're going to be known by your fruits. In much the same way trees and plants are known by what kind of fruit they produce. Here's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Obvious answer. So, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you shall recognize them by their fruits. What's true, what's false, what's real, what's imaginary, you will know them by their fruits. This is a theme that runs all the way through the Bible. Jesus used this telling illustration, grapes don't grow on thorns and figs don't grow on thistles. In other words, the caliber of belief is measured by the quality of behavior. The caliber of belief is measured by the quality of behavior. When you teach children, teach, teach children, teach adults, uh, we're going to uh, learn to ride a bicycle. You actually ride a bicycle is the goal, right? You don't just learn about riding bicycles. You, you, you don't just teach them that they ought to ride bicycles. It's good to ride bicycles. You should be ashamed of yourself if you don't ride a bicycle. But a lot of what we... What we work with, it seems like in spiritual things, is oh, as long as you know what you should do, that's, it's, it's all knowledge-based. That's all you have to worry about. You don't actually have to do anything about your faith. You don't actually have to act on this. You don't have to be obedient to what God said. You just need to know what you ought to do. And we're going to be really stretched as followers of Jesus when we deny His Word. You can't just talk about this. Discipleship. Following after Jesus is responding when occasions arise when, with, with the heart of Jesus. It's practical application, not just biblical information. And it, it, the more time I spend in this world that is so broken, the more I see biblical information has been elevated to sky high and, and practical application is almost non-existent in the life of people who are calling themselves Christians. It cannot be so. It's not that it shouldn't be so. You oughta. It's just, it's not so. And uh, that encourages me to challenge it. Once you decide to get serious about becoming like Christ, you're going to need some practice. And here's the great part. God will help you. God will help you grow. And the practice that he loves to throw my way is to challenge me. To put me in situations where it's just not all going really well. You know, we had this week last week where my timing is everything. So in this series, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Okay, well in my preparations, I stay a few weeks out so we can work on music and all that. Last week, sermon that was on my desk that I was banging away at all week was on patience. You know what happened last week? Air conditioner went out, dishwasher broke, hot water heater uh, had to be replaced. All last week. 
at our house. And the fruit of the Spirit is thinking, what's the next one? i got to think about what the next one is and then just put on my armor to get ready for it. Because, because God puts you in a spot where you, you, he, He's going to develop things in you. God's going to put you in the laboratory of growth when you get serious about becoming like His Son. That's what it means to... So instead of asking, hey, why are these things happening to me? You start asking, to what end are these things happening to me? What is the purpose of God in this? What's he trying to develop in me? If you're working on a sermon on patience, you got a pretty good idea where that road's going. So you, you embrace it and you learn from it and you, you, you grow through it. Discipleship requires practice. And to become like Jesus, to become like Jesus means you have to work on it regularly. You can't just do it on Sunday. You can't just do it a few times a year. Uh, discipleship, you grow you mature, you become a real devoted follower of Christ by a long obedience in the same direction. It's one of my favorite phrases about discipleship. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Now, a disciple obeys Jesus whenever there's a choice. And we're we're confronted with choices on a daily basis, multiple times a day. And every time, what are you going to do with each choice? And as you develop the habit of saying, okay, I'm going to go God's way instead of the world's way, instead of my way, instead of what's easiest, instead of what causes the path of least resistance, I'm going to do what God wants me to do based on his word, based on his truth, based on his character. He has my yes, whatever he calls me into. Now, in Galatians, Paul united this idea about fruit with the indwelling life of Christ as lived out in the power of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit, in this expression, the fruit of the Spirit. And then he defined, this is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it is not everything that is produced by the Holy Spirit in us. But it's some key things that, like having four wheels on my car, my car runs pretty well with all four wheels. If I'm missing one of those wheels, it's not going to run as well. Your Christian life will run a whole lot better if you got all nine of these wheels on the ground. These things called the fruit of the Spirit. And, and Paul talks about it. He says, you know, there's, there's the fruit of the Spirit, and there's the things that happen when you're living in the flesh. When you're just doing it your way, by your plan, according to your will, apart from God. And he, he talks about what that looks like, too. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But as always, when you, when you follow Jesus, and Paul does a great contrast, and we'll read that here in a couple of seconds because we're looking at Galatians chapter 5. There are things when you follow Jesus that need to go and things that need to grow. And we're going to try to discern what are the things that need to go and what are the things that need to grow today. This is Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 19. And here's how Paul, he lays out, well, I'll go back to 18 because I'm going to give you a bonus verse because I love you. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, verse 19, the works of the flesh, the things that this is the default nature of character for sinful people in a sinful world. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is one of those great verses. Boy, after you get one like that, just the world seems so heavy and life seems so dark. And then, but... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is uh, no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? What we're going to do is we're going to take them in order as Paul gives them to us here. And we're going to start breaking these out. That means next Sunday we're going to talk about love, the fruit of love in our life. And we're going to work our way through. And I'll share some of these. Uh, uh, Roger Taft is going to share one of these. Jimmy Smith is going to share one of these. We're going to share the, all the nine fruit of the Spirit. But I want to give you a brief overview of what's to come. 
And this is what Paul identifies as the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit comes from the root of a relationship to God. He says love. And this is really the most God-like quality of all. It's first because, uh, because of its importance. Because it covers so many of the rest. It's not an emotion. It is an act of the will. It's displayed in selflessness and sacrifice. It is unconditional. It is self-giving. Joy. That's one of those three letters, but boy, is it a big word in God's word. It has nothing to do with how much money you have, how happy you, f- you, you feel because you have lots of pleasures in life or circumstances or going the way you want them to. It is joy that's bigger than whatever is going on in you or around you. Peace is wholeness, togetherness. It's a calmness that you have even in the middle of a terrible storm. Patience. Long-suffering and tolerance of difficult people and difficult circumstances. There are all kinds of applications for patience. I have enjoyed preparing this first set. That one on patience, I can't har- I may have to preach it next Sunday out of order. I am ready for that one. Uh, mark your calendar. Kindness. That's a tender, benevolent attitude. It's a non-critical, non-judgmental, forgiving spirit, kindness. Goodness, goodness, goodness is the practical application of the kindness. You're doing something when you get to goodness. It's active. It's helping others. Faithfulness, just you're trustworthy, reliable, dependable. You follow through, and you also have a constant dependence on God while you're doing it. Gentleness, that's that humble submissiveness, sometimes translated meekness. Blessed are the meek, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. It's power under control. It's not weakness in character. And then self-control, an inner discipline, a strength to control appetites and desires, the ability to keep, keep oneself in check. Now, fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I can hardly wait for the school year to start again. And the reason is, then I get to go to the grocery store again. During the summer, Rhonda goes to the grocery store. During the school year, uh, my day off is typically Friday, and so I get to go to the grocery store. When I go to the grocery store, I, uh, I take my basket, I take the wet wipes, and I take about 45 minutes, and I wipe down the whole thing, <laughs> and then I'm off. And the first place I stop is the produce section, because it's my favorite place. Because I love the color. I love the variety, I love the smells, and I'll hang out for a while in the produce section, and I will gather up all of that first. It's probably a terrible plan, because i got a lot of grocery store to go, but, uh, so, so it's all rancid by the time I leave the grocery store, but at least I'm making a good deal on the front end. Now, one of my favorite things about the grocery store, and by the way, this is scare some of you off, although I go like it before 8 o'clock on Fridays, so I'm not going to encounter a lot of you at the grocery store on Fridays. But I love to people watch at the grocery store, and especially in the produce section, because people are fun in the produce section. Everybody has their own philosophy of how to go at the produce section of a grocery store. Uh, Some people, uh, any of you, you see a pyramid of apples, and you think, you know, I'm pretty sure the best apple in that whole pyramid is right here on the bottom of this. That's why when you walk through the produce section, you find apples on the floor, because somebody said, You know, there's one right up here on top, but oh, I don't want that one. I want the one on the bottom. So uh, some of you are that person, and you know know who you are. Some people, uh, I I don't have an overly sensitive nose, but a lot of people, they're going to smell every piece of fruit they buy. Uh, Some of you are smellers. You're going to, what does it smell like? Some of you, you're squeezers. You're going to handle, which again, I have a lot of wet wipes, and I'm wiping down fruit too as I go, because I don't know where you've been. Uh, and so, but some people are, are squeezers, feelers. They're, they're studying it all. Uh, some people, they, uh, they shake and listen. Some people, they, they're tasting grapes. Some people are eating a lot of grapes. I don't know where those grapes have been either, but I know they haven't been washed before you're throwing them in your mouth, and I'm concerned about you. I'll pray for you. And there are folks who, they polish every apple. They're buying their individual apples. Instead of a bag of apples, they'll polish every apple before they go in. Uh, One of my favorite things is to look suspiciously at the bottom of an 
thing of strawberries. Because, man, they'll sneak a bad one in on the bottom of that thing if you're not careful. So you're always watching out for the strawberries. But it's not uncommon then for Christians to approach the fruit of the Spirit the same way you pro- approach the produce section of your grocery store. And, and that is that some people, they're really loving. And they'll just squeeze, they'll squeeze love for all they can get out of it. Others are joyful to a fault. And they're polishing their jokes and polishing their smiles. And, but like buyers in the fruit section of a grocery store, they concentrate on the fruit that interests them the most, that are their favorites, to the neglect of a lot of other things that maybe aren't their favorite, but that would be really good for them. They don't bother with other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. So what happens is, the people who are really, really loving may not be good at all at self-control. And the people who, by their, some, some of the fruits can come easier for me, easier for you than others. Hard to be, for the gentle, often to be faithful. It's hard for the faithful to be kind. Because they're maybe more of a rule follower and, and not have the compassion of Christ for people. And, and so, you need a balance of all these things. Here's what we need to remember. The word in the Bible, when we get to fruit of the Spirit, it's a singular word, which is really weird when you have a word uh, referring to nine things. So, you have a plurality of fruit and, and a singular word. Not fruits, but fruit. And here's why. The fruit of the Spirit is not a collection of unrelated Here's an orange, here's an apple, here's a banana, here's a grape, here, here, here's some raspberries, which are very popular with our crowd today. Now, you can't select this one, neglect this one, you can't pick and choose like it's a cafeteria of which ones that you want according to your personal preference or inclinations. The fruit of the Spirit is this composite of what it means to be all around behavior that reflects Jesus, that, that reflects the character of God. It's the direct result of a living relationship to a living God through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Holy Spirit of God flows through us. Here's what happens when we think fruit instead of fruits. We start taking away the freedom to be picky about which ones we like and which ones we don't like. And we, we're unable to choose this behavior to the neglect of this behavior. And we lock ourselves into a position of recognizing all aspects of fruit, whether or not they come easily to us, cannot be easily discarded. Uh, They all need to be considered. And that's why we're going to take a whole week on each one. Here's the challenge. This is a challenge for me, challenge for us, challenge for the church. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of God. This is when I said, uh, you can't do this. You can't produce the fruit in yourself. You can't. Because this is the character of God. How hard is it in our daily behavior to live out our faith to reflect the immensity of the holiness of the character of Almighty God? There's a story about a little boy. He had a scrawny little chicken he was trying to raise in the backyard. And the scrawny little chicken, it would would lay an egg, but it wasn't much to brag about. It wasn't going to win anything at the state fair. It was a pitiful egg. And very small, and because his chicken was very small, and he just got so aggravated with his little chicken, and he, he went online, he made an order, package arrived, he knew what it was, he took it to where his little chicken was, and he, he unwrapped it in front of his little chicken, and it was an ostrich egg. And he held it up to his little chicken, and he said to his little chicken, you take a good look at this, and you try harder. There's about as much chance of us reproducing the character of God as there is that chicken laying an ostrich egg. Now, the works of the flesh, that's the other side of this. The works of the flesh, they come quite easily to us. This is the natural bent of who we are as a people living in a broken, sinful world and, and still wrestling with the tug of war of a sin nature, even after we come to Christ, that every, every day is, is a wrestling match. The works of the flesh are done quite easily. Whether you're saved or unsaved, it's like a flower bed that goes untended. It's just going to grow weeds. You don't have to make it grow weeds, encourage it to grow weeds. It's just going to grow weeds. And the same thing is true in your spiritual life. You neglect the spiritual life, you're going to grow 
the works of the flesh. They show up on their own. It's the default destination of a sinful heart. And again, that Galatians, starting in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, this is one of those things about being a disciple. We hold up this standard. This is what a disciple looks like. This is what a follower of God looks like. And then here's me over here. And how, how do I measure up to that? They ought to be coming together, but we keep finding, well, this is this, and here's me, and I'm, I'm, sort, of, I'm sort of off balance here. I'm not where I need to be. I'm not lining up with what God said. And a part of the Fruit of the Spirit series we're in is to say, at each week, how am I doing? How do I measure up there? And is that a place where God really needs to work in me and I need to be working with Him? Because we cooperate with Him in these things of growth. You don't have to plan and prepare for the works of the flesh because you're going to find yourself leaning into the downhill nature of the works of the flesh. This is, they're, they're the easy ones. But when it, that's where the road naturally goes in a sinful world, a sin-filled heart. But the fruit of the Spirit is produced in us by God's own Spirit and only in the lives of those who know Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about fruit. Uh, around 106 times in the Old Testament, there's a reference to fruit in a spiritual way. 70 times in the New Testament, there's a reference to fruit in a spiritual way. Believers are called to produce spiritual fruit. Some of the things the Bible talks about is spiritual fruit, not these nine things. But other things, like praise to the Lord. One of the things that happens when you belong to, you belong to the Lord, you have a living relationship to the living God, is it's going to spill over in how you worship. And that doesn't just mean uh, that suddenly you're going to become a talented singer, because some of you, I don't have that kind of miracle working power. I, I, sometimes that'd be a pretty good stretch for the Lord even. However... Your worship is just your love for God. Not, not, not just when you sing, but that's a part of it. And, and the fruit of a relationship to God is worship for God. The fruit of a relationship to God is reaching out to people who are lost. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. That's just going to be a part of it. And again, that's a real measure of, do I care about lost people? Am I doing anything to demonstrate I care about lost people? The ones that are in my circles of influence? The ones living around me? The ones I already have a relationship with? Is there something in me that's being stirred toward them? Because the fruit of the Spirit in us is, you're going to care about lost people. And seeing lost people found. And then just uh, Colossians 1.10 talks about one of the fruit of the Spirit is it's just godly living in general. That when you say, this is what godly living looks like, this is, what, this is what God in me looks like, those things start lining up when, when there's spiritual fruit in your life. So here's what Paul is saying. There, there's action fruit, and action fruit comes from attitude fruit, and the fruit of the Spirit is attitude fruit. It comes from inside to produce what's on the outside. Fruit has to do with character. Fruit is the outward expression of the working of God's Spirit in the life of a believer. Fruit is the manifestation of God's character. Fruit is the harvest of a Christ-dominated life. And, and you can't buy this fruit and then attach it to your life like tying an apple on a peach tree and hope that's going to work out. It comes, it comes up from within. And when it's on the inside, there's external evidence that it is there of this indwelling Christ. And, and again, you can't do this by an act of your will, by trying harder, any more than uh, my, my peach tree can really concentrate and try hard and, and pop up some apples. And the good news is, pressure off. You don't have to. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does in you. God, the Holy Spirit, in you as a follower of Jesus Christ, is working in you. There, there is one responsibility you have in the midst of that. And key word, abide. 
Some translations will say remain, because now we're moving to John 15. So you might want to make your way there. John chapter 15, John's gospel. The way you do this is to abide. I, I, I did some kind of a per, one of my personal studies. I'll take on, I'm, I'm going to read through my Bible. I'm going to focus on a variety of things during the course of a year. But I often have one thing that is just my all-out focus. In 2014, my all-out focus was on John 15. I spent all year reading everything I could find, doing a whole lot of writing, a whole lot of praying about, about John chapter 15. And, and for the next two years, until the end of last year, I had uh, right under my computer screen, big letters, just one word, abide, abide. And the way that the fruit of the Spirit is going to be developed in you is for you to abide. How can we possibly live this life reflected in the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus tells us how in John 15. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, you can't do this. You can't accomplish this on your own by your good intentions. This is something only the Holy Spirit can do. You abide. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So, and so, prove to be my disciples. Wow. That makes fruit bearing, that, that puts it on a different level. You prove to be his disciples. It's demonstrated. There's evidence that you belong to him. That's a big deal. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Okay, so the symbols. In John 15... The vine, it's like the, the trunk of a fruit tree. The vine is the trunk of the grape vine. The vine is Christ, and he is the source, and he is the life giver. The vine dresser, the one caring for it, that's the father. And there's some pruning that takes place. In my life recently, God has been snipping some things away, taking some things away, pruning, refining, clarifying for me. He wants to bring you to fruit-bearing condition. Branches, that's the believer. And the fruit is produced out on the branches. Well, they think about where. Usually it's out on the, out on the end of the branch. Uh, there's a little faith required to be out on the end of the branch. That's where the fruit's produced. And then there's the sap, the indwelling Holy Spirit that, that runs everything from the, from the vine into the branches, and fruit is produced. God's Spirit produces fruit. We bear fruit. And that is especially true in times of difficulty. Some of the greatest fruit in my life has been produced in the most challenging, difficult, trying times of my life. Because how we respond when life is hard, when challenges come, determines a lot about spiritual growth and a lot about the spiritual lessons we learn. There are many facets to what it means to be a disciple of Christ but the one factor that is not negotiable for Christians who are going to be fruitful is that they remain, they abide in Christ. And what I need to be reminded of as I read this passage, it was hammered home to me clearly recently. Jesus expected his followers to bear fruit. This was not like, yeah, some, some of my followers will bear fruit. Sometimes people who love me will actually do something. But, but this, is, this is foundational to being his follower. In verse 5, the emphasis of Christ is not on bearing fruit, though. You see what his emphasis is? It's on remaining in him. Again, I can't make myself bear spiritual fruit. I can't work so hard that something eternal is going to happen. As a pastor, that, that's not a possibility. There's only one way anything eternal happens. It's because God working through me, his fruit in me, on display and in action in the world, that's how spiritual fruit takes place, in me and around me, by remaining, abiding in Him. So by remaining in Christ 
As a branch depends on the vine, the believer will bear fruit. And you cannot avoid bearing fruit. Because bearing fruit's what a healthy vine does. This shouldn't be a shocker. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to be some special emphasis. It's just what a healthy vine does. A vine doesn't work to figure out how to be more productive. It just stay, the branch just stays connected to the vine. That's how fruit is produced. And if the branch is connected to the vine, it's going to bear fruit. And if it's not... It will not bear fruit no matter how hard it tries. So the key to bearing spiritual fruit for you, for me, and for this church family is not trying to force fruit to be developed. It's dedicating our efforts to stay connected to the vine. The word uh, for remain, abide, maintain contact for a sustained time is an important word, but there's another word in here that really you got to take some time for. It shows up more than once in this passage in John 15. And it's a, it's a little word, if. In the Greek language there are, of the New Testament, there are different words for if. You get translated if. Some of them mean since. This one is not that word. It's a word that declares this may or may not happen. There is the possibility of failure. If it's so conditional, it's so maybe so. There's a degree, significant degree of doubt in the word if. Will I bear fruit or will I not bear fruit? And you have to make a choice about that. And we're all making choices every day, multiple times a day. Will I follow Christ today? Will the Holy Spirit guide me today? Will his teaching instruct me today? And that is such a scary word to me. Because it's an ongoing responsibility for the Christian to abide. And you're going to choose whether or not you do. We sometimes think that when we're a Christian, well, I asked Jesus to come to my life. I prayed a sinner's prayer. Now I'm all good. I'm going to put my life on spiritual autopilot. And I'm going to just roll along, and whatever happens, it'll just be spiritual evolution. Wherever I land, that's going to be great because I'm going to heaven one of these days. Not so. Well, if you think a sinner's prayer is going to save you for all eternity, you are one deceived individual. Because that just sort of leans you into the game, maybe. But see, there has to be uh uh, the parable of the sower. The shallow soil, the thorny soil. It chokes out what almost happened. I think a lot of people got to a sinner's prayer, and that's as far as it got. And if there's no fruit, we got a real problem. So this is this is a big deal. We have so dumbed down the gospel to mean nothing but I want to go to heaven one day that a lot of people are going to be really some Lord. Lord, Lord, Jesus said. A lot of people. Look at all the great stuff I did. Look at all the nice, good deeds I did. Look at what a swell guy I was. What do you, and Jesus says, I never knew you. And come to find out, it's not a broad way that goes to heaven. It's a very narrow way. And a lot of people are going to be really surprised in eternity because, because they self-define what it meant to be a Christian instead of, instead of actually connecting to the vine. Now, When you start with a conditional if, Jesus clearly communicates there's an ongoing responsibility on the part of disciples to maintain that relationship. And this is the question. It's just, are you going to say yes to Jesus? How does a disciple live in the joy of relationship to Christ and service in his kingdom? Well, you're going to remain in Christ. It's very simple. You remain in Christ. It's not a big mystery thing. You're going to spend a lot of time in God's Word and you're going to spend significant time in prayer if you're going to remain, abide in Christ. And you're going to obey Him. Obedience is a key part of discipleship. It is the foundation of discipleship. And you will do it regularly and obediently and consistently, willingly. And also, if you really belong to Him, you're going to commit yourself to reproducing other disciples. That's just a part of it. My apple there... It comes into being with seeds because it's designed to reproduce. And a disciple is the, displaying the fruit of the Spirit is designed to reproduce more disciples. And when that happens, you'll glorify God and you'll find the joy that God intends for you as a result is what 
John 15 tells us, we were created by God that we should choose to be his disciples. And until we commit to living that life, we're going to be forever frustrated with our Christian life. We're going to become uber consumers, uh, the ultimate consumer of Christian subculture. But we're never going to get around to being a disciple. Until we commit ourselves to live in this life, we're going to be frustrated and unfulfilled. And until we abide, we're not going to bear fruit. And that's where the real joy comes in. You'll know that you're abiding by the fruit that you bear. And again, am I a disciple? Am I abiding? Do I belong to him? Well, the works of the flesh are this. The works of the spirit are this. And that's just one spot where those kind of things are, are spelled out. Where are you falling in those categories? But when, when you're abiding and you're bearing fruit, there are things that are happening in you. There are things that are happening through you. And over the next several weeks, we're going to look at the things that happen, especially in you. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. And again, as with the things that happen uh, beyond you, not just in you, but beyond you, they're measurable and they're discernible. And, and you can see them, you can feel them, you can hear them. They're on display. And here are the things that, that happen with the fruit of the Spirit. They reveal... Do I belong to Jesus Christ? And am I living in right relationship to him if I do belong to Jesus Christ? And it's, it's an extremely clarifying spiritual diagnostic of where we are in relationship to God. Do I belong to him? Am I living in right relationship to him? And, and so... In this process of working through now, starting next week with fruit number one, love, we're going to look at it. And each week, the challenges are the things the Bible says about love as a fruit of the Spirit. Are those things, do the people who know me best and love me most, the, my, my own family, do they see those things in me? Do my friends see those things in me? Are those things consistently on display in me? I know I can't do it by myself. I know I need God's help. I'm going to have to... Not try harder, not check more boxes of did this, did this, did this, good deed, good deed, good deed. But i got to abide in him in all the ways that keep me connected as a branch to the vine. We're going to lean into this. And today we share hard things. Because there are hard things that need to be shared. Well, eternity is hanging in the balance. And, and that's why this is not something that... I could give you 10 ways to be happy in Allen, Texas today from God's Word. And uh, you, can, you can get all of that you want in any number of places. But a lot of people are going to be happy in Allen, Texas and lost for eternity. And we really want to focus on the gospel part of this as a church. And... We want, if we're going to do this, why don't we just do it right? Abide. May it be a good exercise for all of us. Print it out on a piece of paper. Stick it to your forehead. Abide. Abide. My well, God has great things for you. The adventure of the Christian life is found in the abide. Don't stop short of the greatness of the Christian life.